Hi, I'm Bill DeYoung. This is the Catalyst Sessions for Tuesday. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to introduce you to my friend Rui Farias, who is the Executive Director of the St. Petersburg Museum of History. Hello, sir. Hi, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. You had a big new parking lot there, I noticed, when I was down recently. That was part of the pier design, wasn't it? I mean, right on the side there, isn't that all new? The access, uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of it is, yes. I just remember, uh, um, I can't remember where I used to park when I would come down there, but now there's this huge thing on the side. What does being a part of the, the pier, the new pier, do for you down there? Um, well, it's still a new experience for us, obviously. Uh, yeah. I, I remember when, when a few years back when the, the uh, old pier was closed, um, I kind of did a state of the museum address in front of city council. And one of the city council members had asked us, you know, how bad it was now that the pier was closed. And actually, our attendance shot up um, because when they opened those parking lots as the overflow of Beach Drive parking lots, we were actually getting a lot more, uh, you know, foot traffic. But the, the last two and a half years um, behind the pier construction fence has been kind of tough. Um, mm -hmm. But since the pier has opened, I mean, the, the, the walk up traffic has been great. We're, you know, our attendance numbers are shooting back up to, you know, where we're where we projected them to be so and just just the the awareness building the awareness a lot of people are walking in and looking around going i didn't know you were here um so it's it's been a huge help for us that's kind of what i you know assumed to tell you the truth that that you that that this would open up a new avenue of people who hadn't had the experience of going into the museum yet it seems much more open now you know, like it was, like I said before, it was kind of, especially behind all the fences and stuff. Where right. is it? Where is it? Um, since, have you noticed a difference in traffic since the pier, the pier is opened? Well, it, it, and y yes, and, and mostly because uh, obviously there's a lot more foot traffic, but also, you know, as you talked about the parking, the, the parking lot is now adjacent to the building. So when people pull in and park on the north parking lot, the Pelican yeah. lot, um, it is, you know, literally right next to our building. So it, it is building a lot of awareness for us. And we've done some stuff as well. I mean, you know, we, we've given the building a, a lot of loving the existing structure. I mean, mm -hmm. we've painted it, we've remodeled it, we've added some signage to it, we're doing some fun things to it. Um, in the next, you know, few months with um, some of the things we'll be adding to the exterior. So it, it's got a huge, you know, the, we, we've been here for nearly 100 years and this building's been here since yeah. the 50s. So it, 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 it received a huge facelift. That's, you know, let me start there, Ruby, because that was actually going to be my first question and we just started talking, but give me a little history of the History Museum. Uh, you know, it, obviously it wasn't the same building, but it's always been in that location. Give me, give me the whole backstory. <laughs> Sure. It, it, we actually started the, the, the historical society started in uh, 1920. So it's a hundred years old. Uh, but the museum itself, there used to be a building that sat on the same spot where we are now. That was an aquarium. Mm -hmm. uh, a gentleman had a business that had, you know, obviously displaying fish. It was, it was a tourist attraction. Um, and the storm October hurricane of 1921 flooded it as it did most of downtown, destroying a lot of the wooden piers that were downtown. Um, this is and, pre million dollar pier. Oh yes, this, this is back is when the it was the first true municipal pier, but it was a wooden structure. Yeah, um, which was damaged in that storm. Uh, and then uh, af after the storm, um, we had a matriarch by the name of Mary Wheeler Eaton that kind of her and her friends kind of led the charge of creating the historical society. And um, and if you look at some of our our photos we have in our archives of everything from the Benoit Plain to the steamships that were here. There's photos of Mary Wheeler in everything. So it's obvious that she, she ran this town. <laughs> convinced uh, that the city council and the mayor uh, to turn the building mm -hmm. down in, in the early 50s. The new structure was built. Um, and then we've added on since then. But yeah, we've been here for, for nearly 100 years. I, you know, I can't, I know you can tell me this, but I can't remember how old St. Petersburg as a city is, but I'm thinking that in the twenties, there wasn't that much history to talk about yet. No. Um, and we were incorporated <laughs> twice in 1903, the most recent time, but, um, they collected a lot of stuff. Uh, our, our collections numbers in the tens of thousands of, of items. Um, yeah. and the, you know, there's a story that the, you know, the, the, 
director of the museum or the curator would show up in the morning to unlock the door and there'd be boxes of stuff sitting on the doorstep that people mm. would just leave for the historical museum. And, you know, and understandably so, um, you know, in St. Petersburg, as it grew and, and a lot of retirees moved here, um, after they passed, a lot of their artifacts that they brought from up north ended up in our collections um, along the way. So, and it, and it's crazy that some of the stuff that, that, that we have um, that we're discovering actually now that's been tucked away for 50, 60 years because we're in the process of recataloging everything. <laughs> and um, man, some of the things that we're finding are, are truly bizarre and we're actually putting on display as we find them. Well, well give me some examples, you know, I, I'm thinking, <laughs> It's like, oh, Eli okay, Whitney's so, cotton gin is up there, right. and we've Close. got a hundred of them. <laughs> Close. I mean, why in the heck do we have President Taft's pajamas? But we do. Um, and they're on display wow. right now. He was a big man, and there we have them framed the on the The big jammies. Wall. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, General Custer's reading glasses. Uh, I mean, we're discovering all kinds of things like that. Um, pieces of the USS Constitution, the original USS Constitution. Um, Geronimo's autograph. I mean, it, it's just bizarre the things that we're, we're discovering land grants from uh, early Florida when it was still west and east Florida before it was a state. Uh, and we, we're discovering a lot of cool, unique things like that, that, you know, as we get them, preserve them, we stick them on, on display as quickly as we can. Well, how, uh, devil's advocate though, Custer's glasses, I was going to say Custer's sunglasses, but probably not, um, yeah. has nothing to do with Florida or the history of Florida. I mean, can't you sort of barter with some other museum to get something cool that would apply to you? I don't know how this works. But, but you know what, though? And, and that's a question that does come up. Like, what does President Taft's pajamas have to do with Florida? Um, that's, a good, that's a very good question. But I think it, it, true, it tells the uniqueness of our city. I mean, St. Petersburg, you know, we started off with like 12. Um, you know, we were a fishing village in an agricultural area. And I mean, the uniqueness of the city, this is just, it's a bizarre city, really cool, unique history. And people from everywhere just came here over the years, either to visit or to move. And a lot of the things that we've collected, I think represents some of that uniqueness. I mean, we have a 3000 year old Egyptian mummy. Yeah. You know, and, but it ended up in St. Petersburg in such a cool story that we have to keep it because it makes complete sense. Tell, of that, tell, tell me that story. I, I remember that story, but let's, let's go, let's go there. <laughs> well, Why is that mummy here? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the, the brief, the brief story behind it. So basically a ship was traveling, carrying a carnival and came into uh, the port of St. Petersburg and needed repairs. When the repairs were finished, the captain didn't have enough money to pay for the repairs. So he gave the mummy and a sarcophagus to the dock master in exchange for payment. So the dock master was charging people, you know, a nickel a quarter, what it was to go look at the mummy. Wow. Um, once the bill was was paid off, they donated it to the museum. So it's been here since, the, you know, 26, I think, 25, 26. Um, so yeah, it's, the mummy's been here for almost 100 years. So. Has it been, you know, what do they call carbon dated or whatever? To, do you yes, know how? Yes, yeah, exactly because that was, that, was, is. that was the question actually, is because, you know, it was part of traveling carnival. So how'd they know it was real? Um, yeah. So they ran it through uh, and they couldn't run it through a regular CAT scan machine. They had to run it through the one that's used for dolphins for marine life. And it truly is a 3000 year old Egyptian mummy. Wow. Uh, so, yeah. So again, I mean, why is that in St. Peter's where in right. a museum in St. Pete, but you know, it, 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 it begs the question that we've been dealing with is what's our role going to be? Are we a St. Petersburg history museum? Or are we a history museum in St. Petersburg? Right. Um, and we've got lots of stories to share. I mean, not just of St. Pete, but of Pinellas County and Tampa Bay and the state of Florida. And this is all the cool stuff that came here over the years. So, where did the calf come from? The two headed calf? Uh, Safety Harbor. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Man, you got to explain that now. It just, it was born in a ranch in Safety Harbor. Lived. It was, oh, okay. Yeah, and then when it was, and of course, it, after it passed, it visited a taxidermist, and now it's been on display here for, again, since, I think, 1926. Wow. Um, and you'd be surprised, because, like, when we were doing re some remodeling to that gallery, we had, a, we moved the, the two-headed calf, and it was in my office, actually, while the work was being done and people were coming into the museum and it was like a parade of people coming into my office because I was getting calls from the front desk going, 
you know, this, this, this woman's here and she wants to show her grandkids a two-headed calf. You know, she remembers it when she was a kid. So, you know, it was just people walking in and out of my office looking. At <laughs> if you brought them in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. What, um, Percentage-wise, the, the, the material that you have on display, both, you know, permanent and, and temporary, I guess, what's the percentage of things that you have that aren't out? You know, you usually hear that from art museums. Well, we've only got 10% of it on display. The rest of it's all in storage. Is, uh, is, that, is it like the same way with you? Pretty much. I mean, that, that, that's a good question. I mean, I don't know the exact percentage, but yeah. what we have out on the floor is kind of a fraction of what really we have in our collections. Um, we have we have you know our collections area upstairs and in our archives area upstairs in the museum, but we also have two offsite storage facilities. Wow, that, so, that's got to be what a what a, a daunting prospect to go out and you know and, my and mission it, this month is to dig through that warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> but you know that's been that's been the case though, and it, it's you know God bless the people that you know that ran this museum for a number of years. A lot of it was volunteer based, yeah. um, and in some of our earlier collections that the notebooks are either typewritten or written by hand, you know? So um, our, uh, our collections manager now is going through everything, like I said, and recataloging, photographing, putting it in sure. the database and doing it properly. And this is how we're discovering a lot of these things. Like we, we have a, an exhibit uh, on display now called Building the Sunshine City, which shows the growth of the city from yeah. the 1800s to current day. And um, she discovered when she was going through a lot of the documents, she discovered two documents that we have in a case on display now, one is a newspaper article from the Seabreeze, which was the first newspaper here on the Pinellas Peninsula. And it, it details a story of a, a gentleman moving here or buying land from Detroit, Michigan by the name of John Williams, that mm -hmm. he bought Paul's Landing and other land, which is now downtown St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And then, and also there's a document that basically gives part of that land um, to the Orange Belt Railway. So in those two documents lay the birth of St. Petersburg. And, um, it, you know, it's, we've had them, you know, for forever and they haven't been on display forever. So, you know, it, it's been a fun time finding that stuff and bringing it out for people to see. Does that give you chills when you see something that you haven't seen before that's got a direct link to something? I think as a journalist, that happens to me sometimes. I'll, I'll find something and go. All the time. Holy um, shit. All, you know, all the yeah. time. I mean, we, I mean, it, it, I get, you know, every time I, my phone rings and I see the extension upstairs and, you know, it's, it's my collections manager going, you need to come up here. So wow. I know, like, for instance, I mean, she found documents that were commissioned papers signed by Abraham Lincoln. And I'm looking at these documents in a folder going, this is really Abraham Lincoln's autograph on these, you know, on these papers. So we're finding some really cool stuff. But to answer your question, oh, yeah, serious chills when we find those things. I, I tell you, you know, I, I don't think I understand people who just don't give a hoot about history. To me, it's just, it's so cool. And especially, you're a St. Petersburg native, am I correct? Uh, pretty much. I was actually born in Connecticut, but I don't remember Connecticut. I've lived yeah, here. So it's, okay, so you and I were St. Pete kids. We're, we're not exactly the same age, but we're in the ballpark. Tell me about the St. Pete of your youth. And obviously I'm getting around to Web City here, which we're going to get to. Mm -hmm. I, it's, I'm, I'm going around circuitously. Right. Tell me about what was St. Pete like when you were growing up? Oh, man. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, to live downtown. And yeah. um, it, it, was just, it was just an amazing place to grow up. And I still teach a, a Florida history course at St. Pete High. And yeah. I, I try telling my students what you know, life was like in St. Pete in the late 60s, early 70s, and the things that we used to do and see and enjoy and want you know i my, my first job was selling the evening independent on the steps of the open air post office you know and it was you just don't see that stuff anymore then i would deliver the evening independent on a bicycle you know after school you know, um it was a much different city and i look back now and yeah you know, i either bike ride or you know streets that i don't typically drive every day and I'm, I'm looking at a lot of these buildings that have been quickly disappearing, thinking, man, I wish I would have taken more photos of this stuff back sure. in the 70s and 80s, that, you know, these beautiful 1920s homes that were still there um, at that time. But it, it was a much different city, much more laid back. Uh, um, and it's weird, though, because, like, people, so one, one of my, my early jobs in my professional careers, I worked for the Festival of States. 
And I worked with the Sun Coasters putting on the Festival of States for seven years. And um, all, this was, and this was during the bad time of downtown. This was during when, you know, if you wanted to take someone to lunch, you had to drive to Harvey's because it was the closest restaurant to go to. Mm. Uh, but I remember that our whole focus was to create events to bring people downtown. Yeah. Because nobody came downtown. Right. I remember um, this. And then it's funny too, sure. because yeah, now you talk to people, you know, who, who grew up here and they're like, oh my God, I hate going downtown because there's no parking. And like, this is what we work for, for, you know, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. I tried to explain to people. They up, said, oh, make up your mind. Like, tumbleweeds <laughs> and crickets, you know. And yeah, exactly. Nobody went downtown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the festival, let's remind people what the festival of states was because you probably, at least a couple of people who are watching this are going, what's he talking about? <laughs> um, we're all America welcome springtime. I still remember all the taglines. Um, it was a, a <laughs> two-week long civic celebration. So it was kind of, it was Gasparilla without the craziness. Um, it was uh, art shows, three parades. Um, and it actually started, to be honest with you, um, it started, the Chamber of Commerce looked at starting something like this a million years ago. They're trying to figure out how to keep the tourists here one more week. Mm -hmm. Made some changes to it because when tourists would come here back in the day, at the chamber, they would register with their state associations. So with your state association, once a week, they'd have lunch or breakfast or get together and talk about what was happening back in Michigan kind of thing. So the, the chamber, then later the Sun Coasters, uh, convinced these state associations to start building floats depicting their state thus the festival of states so they'd had these parades with all these floats in it and the next thing you start inviting high school bands from those states and yeah the whole thing grew so i mean at the height of it i remember one year and it's it's always hard to judge outdoor attendance figures it depends on who you're talking to obviously um but i remember one of the the main parade was called the parade of states and uh we had the, according to police estimates, were two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand people downtown, so it, it was a big deal. Um, I marched in one of those uh, with my Cub Scout troop when I was uh, <laughs> about ten or something. You know, I remember it was go. really hot. Oh it, yes, like oh, yeah. like today. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So um, Monday, I had a, a piece, a vintage St. Pete piece about Web City which uh, you were kind enough to talk with me uh, at length when, when I was working on that. Um, and uh, just for those of you who don't know, Web City was, I, I can say it's a store, but it, at its height, it was 77 stores over 10 city blocks. And if you know what I'm talking about, if you were here, then you, oh my God, you remember Web City. But you remember Web City very well. And the story of Doc Webb is something that's, uh, you know, kind of close to your heart. And um, tell me why. You know, is it is it inextricably tied up with your childhood, or just because he was so well, cool? Both. Um, yes, it was definitely tied up my childhood. I mean, uh, growing up, like I said growing up downtown. We lived three blocks, four blocks from Web City, um, yeah. so it, it it was a big part of my childhood. I know a lot of my family members worked there growing up, um, but it was. Um, it, it was, you know, people claim it was like the first, he was way ahead of his time. It was like the first mall. It was way more than that. Um, I mean, it, you know, if, if you took, you know, shopping and a carnival type atmosphere and entertainment and just craziness and threw it all together, um, you had Web City. And, you know, and plus the, you know, the, the, the crazy promotions that he did. And he was, he was a master marketeer. I mean, the guy, the guy came up with ideas that were way ahead of his time. Tell us some of the things that he sold there that you remember very specifically. You were telling me about, you know, canned Florida sunshine. Or uh, something you yeah. And I mean, I, I still have a can actually that I showed to my students. It's <laughs> Better not open it. <laughs> yeah. No. So basically it's a can, like, you know, size of a can of peas or something, but you know, it's labeled, you know, genuine, genuine Florida sunshine. Yeah. And then, of course it has this marketing thing on it that, you know, not to open it, you know, North of the Mason Dixon line because you know, <laughs> Yankees will like lose their minds, but they're not used to this bright Florida sunshine. But I mean, you know, it was an empty can and he sold hundreds of thousands of those wow. things. Um, Pretty and, you know, yeah. There were, there were things like, 
anything well i remember when you walked in the area where the grocery store was we actually walked into the, the main building um on the left there was a men's clothing store but then there was of course was the barber shop and that was the thing when you were a kid when you were a young man um you wanted to get your haircut there because you walked across the hall with your receipt and got a free double dip ice cream cone wow. so yeah double you'd be begging dip. you'd be begging your parents every saturday i need a haircut <laughs> you know it's like so I, need a haircut. <laughs> um, I mean and he you know he would just do some some crazy things um he he would bring the circus to town he would just put the circus tents up you know in the parking lot um he would do i remember he shipped in or trucked in a train actually uh ice or snow rather um because you know, most of the kids growing up in st pete had never seen snow oh um, yeah so he brought I've heard of things like that snow. yeah and just wow. dumped it in the parking lot and it lasts like an hour or two whatever you know <laughs> but the kids would, like have snowball fights um he did that um i think we talked about like the watermelon season i remember back then i mean you ate fruit towards you know whatever the season was whatever the like season now. was yeah and um, i remember gosh when the watermelon train car loads of watermelons were coming it was just like a huge party out there you know and um and then of course you know, i you know, we were i don't think we were around when like the heyday was marketing stuff like the rooftop events that he would do um like oh, the roof garden yeah right. yeah it's like i mean he brings folks <laughs> like tyrone garden i mean uh tyrone powers to the gardens yeah uh, you know i think the andrew sisters actually performed there once if i'm not mistaken um you know and, and of course he you know he would do crazy things like he claimed that uh, he would be the first person to sell a million dollars worth of war bonds during World War II. Mm -hmm. um, and he did. Uh, so he you know, brought in all this entertainment and they had nonstop stuff going on stages and he sold a million dollars worth of war bonds in a relatively short period of time. It was less than a week, I think, actually. He was also a... Uh, he was a really good businessman. I mean, the, 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 for, for all the you know wacky low, low prices and everything, I read somewhere that... You know, he always paid cash. He, he bought in bulk, which kept his overhead right. down. Um, but he was, um, you were telling me, in the early days, he would take IOUs, like in the days of the Depression, when it was right. Webb's cut rate drugs. Right. I mean, when you think about it, he opens the store in 1926. Yeah. You know, right at the time when the the land boom collapsed in, in the state of Florida. And, yeah. you know, in less than four years later, uh, was the start of the, you know the Great Depression, and and even during the Great Depression, his stores continued to expand, and Web City grew actually, um, and made profits during that time period. And he 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 was extremely concerned with building a loyal customer base. What um, I'm saying is he wasn't just sort of a snake oil salesman. You know, he was good to his customers, and he was good to this city. He was both. Yeah. <laughs> he was well, definitely. well, yeah, okay. <laughs> He was definitely a snake oil salesman, but he was good <laughs> to his customers. And he, um, yeah. yeah, during the depression, he would take IOUs, he would take chickens, he would take whatever for payment for products that people needed. I wonder if he um, took, uh, you know, mummies and two headed cows as payment. You know? He probably would have. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he would have figured out somewhere how to make money off of them. Yeah. Um, along the way. And he, I mean, he fought for, I mean, granted, you know, he was a good businessman, but he, he, you know, he, he fought for what he thought was best for his customers um, yeah and someone told me that he did not have an office that he literally just roamed the store with a bullhorn someone else said that he would like we got you know chickens three for a dollar oh, or something you know and he he would there there was um well his office was it was almost like an open veranda like on the second floor so you, he could literally walk around and look down into the first floor, like where the grocery store was and the other stuff. Wow. So, you know, and, and he, he would definitely, he, he would see things that weren't selling. And it was almost like in, in a lot of stores, like for instance, you know, the, um, the Kmart blue light special, they yeah. stole that from doc web. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, or, they took their version of it from Doc. Adapted Web. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause he, I yeah. mean, he did, he, he would see, you know, you can go buy cans of peas for a nickel or whatever, you know, yeah. type of thing. Um, so when he saw things weren't, weren't moving, he would do stuff like that. And, but he was also, you know, like I said, he was business smart because people would, they think, how could he do this? All of a sudden he'd get a truckload of lettuce or melons or chickens or whatever. And he's, cause the train would pull up right next to web city and load all this stuff. So if, let's say he was selling, lettuce for like a nickel a head back then 
he knew he was going to do that. So he would raise the price of maybe tomatoes and cucumbers like a nick or a penny each. So he'd make up some of that money, right, along the way. But it was just part of the whole, you know, promotion. Web yeah. City, uh, I think it was 54 years it was there, but ultimately, you know, the Times caught up with it. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the St. Petersburg Times or the Independent, although they did catch up to it quite a bit. Um, but the interesting thing about him, you know, the Pinellas Park store opened and kind of failed. Uh, right. But he was already, he'd already bailed by then. He, it's, it seems like he saw the writing on the wall and said, and his wife had passed. And Correct. I think he was getting ill, but he, he sold all this, he sold his interest in it long, uh, like five years, I think, before it finally went bankrupt. Before it closed. And he, I think that, um, the one, I mean, as successful and crazy successful as he was in, you know, in business in the city, um, the one thing that he didn't realize was the the, the next generational shopper. Um, and, and I still remember this. I, I I I remember this like it was yesterday. So Sears in Roebuck used to be downtown on what was then Ninth Street on MLK, where the County Health Building is across yeah. the street from County yeah. So that was the Sears store. I remember when they moved to where they were at Tyrone Square Mall, but the mall wasn't there. It was just the Sears store. I remember. I was going to Tyrone Junior High School at that time, so I remember very well. There you, there you go. Yeah. So I, I remember. My yeah. father used to love shopping. You know, tools. Of course, you had to go to Sears to buy tools. Oh yeah. So uh, I remember being there, with my dad and him looking out, and they were they just cleared the land and they were putting up like the steel beams, you know, to mm -hmm. build the mall. And my dad looking out the window saying, this is going to be the end of downtown. Um, and pretty much it was. Yeah, um, yeah. And Doc Webb didn't, it was too little too late, I think. I think he thought that his, his loyal shoppers would continue through generational situations. Um, but, you know, people like shiny new things. And, you know, when, when the city after World War II and the city started moving further west, shopping centers were being built. And finally, the mall in 1972, I think it was, that, you know, opened up. Mm -hmm. Um, it was too little too late and he, he didn't do it. He didn't do enough to compete with that, um, along the way, but he was, um, he was, uh, smart enough business enough to, uh, sell his stock. Yeah. And that's what he did before he actually sold it, uh, to the Texas based company. Uh, there, there's still a lot of wailing and gnash, gnashing of teeth about, oh, you know, it's it's just too bad that the old stuff is gone or you know past uh, it, to me it's like i think change is inevitable i think everything has its time and right. and you know witness saint pete the saint pete of today is very very different from the one you and i grew up in correct you know, i don't think it's necessarily a bad thing i'm i'm grateful there isn't a burger king on every corner you know mm -hmm. I'll give it give it time maybe after you and i are on there will be i don't know hey listen we only have a couple of minutes left but i wanted to talk with you about the expansion of the museum which has been yeah. talked about for a while kind of what's happening and and you know timeline for that what what you think is going to happen well we we've uh we had three stages of construction we completed the first one and the third one the second stage was supposed to be the uh, expansion, a 10,000 square foot expansion, expansion to the museum mm -hmm. um, that will include a visitor center, uh, as well as the second floor would be our new permanent exhibit space where we would move all our collections to an yeah. exhibit to keep them safe you know, from, from the elements. Um, and then on top of that is a rooftop terrace that will overlook the entire Pier District in the downtown. That's um, nice. yeah. yeah, it's gonna be gorgeous. Uh, we were supposed to break ground this month <laughs> um, but um, the, the peer delay happened, um, and then of course the COVID situation happened, and it, and it, and it pushed us back. So we kind of changed gears, and everything that was in phase three, which was going to happen after the expansion, which was going to give the existing building a lot of loving that it needed, we did that while we were closed. We closed on March 14th and just recently reopened. So while we were closed, we did all that to the existing building. So now we're moving forward again with with the expansion. Uh, process and we're hoping to break ground after the first of the year which actually works out perfect because that means we'll be done and open to celebrate our hundredth birthday what so, what what year exactly is that your uh, birthday be, would 2022 be 2022 will be 100 20, the museum oh, itself will be 100 years old yes yeah 
the historical society. What was that lady's name who's in all the pictures? Mary the Wheeler, one? Mary Wheeler Eaton. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. remember that. Yeah. Um, you know, there, I, one thing I've talked to Will Michaels about is there, you know, they're gonna put up this, the, the Janus statue Mm -hmm. um the, it's sometime maybe september october something like that that's what it looks like yes are you guys tied in with that at all because of the are you doing anything for that yeah we, we we've been working with them on it i mean it's a it's a great project it's you know yeah. on the exact site where the hangar was where tony janice pushed that thing into the water back in yeah thing. um and we have the working replica still hanging from our ceiling i know uh, <laughs> and, and that that whole the janice benoit story is a huge part of our, our new main exhibit that we'll be building because it's, it's, it was an amazing piece of history that the city owns. Um, yeah, so we're looking forward to it. Yeah. It's gonna be great. We had uh, Mark Ayling on here, uh, and actually it's been maybe two months now, but mm -hmm. he was you know working on it and he, he took the camera or his laptop, you know, through his studio and he was formulating Janice and the mayor's heads, you know, and <laughs> here's how it works. And, and uh, so I'm looking forward to writing about that too. Rui, I think we are done today. Thank you so much for giving us your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm going to call you later. Something else I need to ask you about for yet another uh, piece of Any St. Pete history. <laughs> Anytime. But you know what? You mentioned like if the city didn't change, we wouldn't have a history museum. So <laughs> Yeah, boy, you know what? I mean, in, in another hundred years, we're going to need a few more floors. <laughs> I know. No <laughs> kidding. No kidding. My friend, thank you. Thank Have you. Take care. Day. You too. All right.